Aliens, UFOs, and demons. Are there any connections there? Stay with us. We got a special guest joining us, the most hated man in ufology. Stops by TBT Hosea 46 for a special Halloween edition. What's going on, everybody? This is your boy, Trevor, Trevi Trev, one half of TBT Hosea 46 podcast, Truth Be Told, Hosea 46 podcast, coming to you guys with another exciting episode on today. But first, just a little bit of house. As you guys know, we do a little bit of news for you. If you don't watch it, we still give it to you a little bit. Amy Coney Barrett hearing conclude. Here's what happens next. In Amy Comey, Coney Barrett's confirmation hearings are over. The proceedings in the Senate Judiciary Committee didn't appear to derail her nomination, keeping her on a fast track to be confirmed to the Supreme Court before Election Day. Throughout the four days of hearings, senators peppered President Donald Trump's nominee with questions about her views on controversial issues that could come before the high court, such as abortions, guns, and the Affordable Care Act. Definitely be keeping our eyes on that one. Donald Trump and Joe Biden to have a dueling town halls as Harris cancels campaign travel. Also, this is kind of an older one, but it's going to be dealing with our topic on tonight. Americans skeptical of UFOs, but say government knows more. Two-thirds in the U.S. say government knows more than it's saying on UFOs. One-third thinks some UFOs are actual sightings of alien spacecraft. Residents of the West show highest belief. Joining me on today, I've got a good, good guest for y'all. This is I'm, I'm smiling from ear to ear with this guest. Um, I'm going to let him give the details about himself, but... Uh, joining me on today is Mr. Joseph Jordan. Welcome, Mr. Jordan. Trevor, how are you? Thanks for having me on your show. Oh, most definitely. I'm honored to have you here. I am. I got familiar with your work through uh, Nick Redfern's book, uh, Final Events, uh, and the Secret Government Group on the Demonic UFOs in the Afterlife by Mr. Nick Redfern. And when I got to your section that he wrote on you, the interview that he did, I was just blown away i mean it's, it's some awesome ones in there but the you know your background and also being titled the most hated man in uf <laughs> ufology or ufology excuse me i was like yeah there's a reason why he's the most hated man so uh tell us a little bit about yourself whatever you want the audience to know you can take 90 seconds here to tell us a little bit about that your background and what you bring to the table okay well, professionally, I'm a, I'm a safety professional, and currently I'm uh, a contractor safety specialist working for the, uh, the U.S. military. I'm currently living in South Korea. Been over here about 10 years now. Prior to coming over here, I was working at the Kennedy Space Center there in Florida as a safety specialist. Um, and I was there right up until the shuttles closed out and figured I better start looking for some other employment as they wound down the, you know, the program mm -hmm. and decided to, you know, let the gov let somebody else pay my way to see the world and got into contracting and ended up here in beautiful South Korea. Place is awesome. Um, like I said, been here 10 years now and uh, not sure if I'll ever come back except oh. to visit, you know? Yeah. Uh, it's just such a beautiful place, but I'm also have an interest and in study in uh, ufology uh, 25 years now, I am a 25-year member of the Mutual UFO Network. Mm -hmm. I'm the national director for MUFON for South Korea. I'm part of their inner circle, um, part of their rapid deployment star team. Um, and that's on the, the MUFON side. But I'm also the co-founder and the head of CE4 Research Group, which we put together 20-some years ago 
to look at our research findings and studies into the so-called alien abduction phenomenon. Um, separate from chasing UFO sightings, uh, we decided to focus on the idea of abductions, feeling that was more of a frontline event to this phenomenon and we were going to get answers. It looked like it would be from here. And that's where our focus has been in CE4 research, you know, for the 20 plus years now. Uh, we just finished our putting a book together, uh, my co-author and I, Jason December, mm -hmm. and I put together Piercing the Cosmic Veil. It just, just came available on Amazon in July, mm -hmm. and uh, it covers our 20 plus years of research in CE4, shows our findings, answers a lot of our major questions that come at us. And within the book are over 60 never before seen testimonials that have come in over the years that I can share mm -hmm. to back up as evidence to what we have found. Nice. Nice. Um, so speaking of which you, you mentioned you work with NASA. How did you go from NASA to focusing on aliens and UFOs? Well, actually, I was into ufology um, long before I got into working at the Kennedy Space Center. Mm -hmm. And because of that, I thought it would be, <laughs> my bosses thought it would be a problem getting my security clearance when I was at the Space Center because of my involvement in ufology. But as it turned out, uh, when everybody found out what I was into there, they were more interested than anything else, you know, asking questions. Right. So, so it, it wasn't a problem being able to work there and, you know, and have the background I've had uh, in ufology up to that time. Um, matter of fact, everywhere I went out there, I saw all signs of people had posters and, you know, collectibles and things like that in their work areas that were into things that were far more bizarre than I was. So. Yeah. Yeah. Now, were you a Christian during this process of, you know, between NASA, UFO research, where, where were you at spiritually? When I first got into looking at UFOs, uh, it was an accident that, that got me started in the first place. Um, I was 40, right at 40 years old, 41 years old at the time. I was, at that time, I was working at um, the world's leading uh, boat manufacturing company there in Florida. Mm -hmm. um, Sea Ray boats, and uh, I worked at product development and engineering. And I had vacation time that I had added up, and uh, I had an opportunity to go visit my brother, who was in the Air Force at the time, finishing up his career mm -hmm. of 20 years. And he was in Elmendorf in Alaska, so we I took the opportunity to go visit him. I had tickets that I could go up there with that I had acquired. I took my uh, eight-year-old son at the time with me, and I took my mother with me because I was mm -hmm. going up to see my, my brother, his wife, and his two kids. So kind of let family see each other who hadn't seen each other in a while. Right. So on that trip, what happened is uh, this was back before, you know, all the technology we have today. Mm -hmm. um, your kids might, kids listening might not understand that, but yeah, I had to go to the little kiosk at the Orlando airport to find me a magazine or a book to read. And I'm looking around, and you know, I was an avid science fiction reader when I was younger. So I figured, uh, maybe I can find something in that realm to read on the air, you know, the flight up. It's mm -hmm. going to be ten hour flight right. to Anchorage from Orlando. So I went looking around, and uh, nothing really caught my my attention in a magazine. So I went over to the fiction book area, and um, didn't see anything there, and started looking in some of the nonfiction. And this book caught my attention. And it read like a science fiction book, but I turned it over and it, everything about it said it wasn't a science fiction book. It was based mm -hmm. on real research. Mm -hmm. So that kind of puzzled me and uh, it, it kind of grayed the line between reality and fiction. So right. I bought the book and I finished the book quite quickly. And that was my opening of the door to go down the rabbit hole of ufology. Mm -hmm. And just so you know, that book was... UFO crash at Roswell, and uh, it's still available. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it talked about something that they say actually happened, but up until that time, I had no interest in all this stuff. As far as I was concerned, aliens were fictional characters. 
Uh, I didn't believe in, you know, anything out there in space. I had no interest in any of this stuff, Mm -hmm. but this really caught my attention. Right. And I started exploring it, uh, became involved with a gentleman in Orlando um, who at that time had just opened up on International Drive, a little UFO museum. Mm -hmm. And what it was, was a walkthrough historical knowledge type museum. You go through there and you see the whole history of ufology in this little shop. Mm -hmm. But I got to talking to him and he was also a member of MUFON, the Mutual UFO Network. And as I kept making trips over and talking with him, he saw my interest was real high in this subject matter. So he asked me, he says, uh, you're from Bavard County, you said. And I said, yes, sir, over on the coast by the Space Center. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, you know, there's no MUFON chapter there. Why don't you consider opening up your own chapter? And you can study all this stuff yourself, you know, set up over there. So I, I said, yeah, that sounds like an idea. So he put me in contact with the MUFON state head, and uh, I talked with them. They appointed me state section director for Brevard County and Volusia County, which is where Daytona is at. Mm-hmm. And away I went. I set up a MUFON chapter. Part of the requirements of being a state section director for MUFON in your county is having monthly meetings to where you open it up to the public and you educate the public and answer any questions. Plus, it's also an opportunity for um, membership drive for MUFON. Mm-hmm. And I said, okay. And um, so I took a sign, went to a library. They said, hey, you can have a room for free as long as you're not charging people. And we give you all the video stuff you need to do your presentations with all for free mm-hmm. as long as you don't charge anybody well i wasn't there to make money i was just there to fulfill the requirement for mufon so hung a sign up on the door it says free ufo meeting open to public you ever thought about what would happen if you did that mm. the kind of people that would show up mm-hmm. i had no idea and let me tell you all types of people show up for a meeting like that people you never thought you would ever run into. These people Mm -hmm. had stories that just were absolutely mind-blowing experiences that they had gone through. And I thought, yep, this is going to be fun. Well, within the next few months, I had some people that were really interested in doing the actual research part. And I trained them up as field investigators like myself and MUFON. And we set up to be able to um, except sighting reports that would be coming in through the police department, sheriff's department, or the local newspaper. Most people would call them if they saw something, um, not knowing that we were available, but we got them to where they would share them with us, and we'd go out and follow up on their reports for MUFON. So we're up and running. We're following UFO reports. We're having our monthly meetings. But something was puzzling me, and that was some of the people coming to the meetings. Some of the people coming to the meetings were very distraught. Mm -hmm. Um, They were, their lives had been turned upside down. Um, They weren't happy people. They had experienced something that they just could not explain. Some of them said it was reoccurring experiences. Mm. And these were the people that were dealing with what is called the so-called alien abduction experience. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I I really felt for these people. I didn't know what I could do for them. They came to the meetings thinking that we had answers for them, you know, but we didn't. We were asking the same questions that the rest of the leading researchers in the world were asking and still not getting answers to be able to tell what this really was. And, you know, why is it happening to certain people? And, can it be stopped? We were asking the same questions. Mm-hmm. So what we decided to do is focus more on these people because we felt that these people were saying they were in contact with the entities that were behind the UFO sightings. Mm-hmm. So if you think about that logically, if you're trying to get to answers about something, you want to get to the people that are on the front line. Right these people were on the front line. So we decided to focus more on the abduction experience and the people that were having them. Mm -hmm. Well, MUFON wasn't set up at the time to investigate abductions, um, mainly just sighting reports. So at that time, we decided to, to make a new entity of research 
and do the research through the new entity and then just make sure that all of our work was there for peer review, Mm -hmm. um, even to MUFON. I wanted to make sure that our members were MUFON members so that people knew that we had gone through the proper training of investigation and doing research in the scientific method. So we formed a CE4 research group. Mm -hmm. CE4 stands for Close Encounter Fourth Kind. Um, Your listeners are probably very familiar with Close Encounters of the Third Kind, the movie from Steven Spielberg. Well, Close Encounters of the Third Kind is contact, Mm -hmm. okay? But Close Encounters of the Fourth Kind is alien abduction. Mm -hmm. And nowadays, if you've got listeners there that are very well-versed in this ufology, you know that CE5 is being talked about by Dr. Stephen Greer. Right. And right. that's where he's promoting a type of contact with that, with these like transcendental contact. Yes. Yeah. Um, didn't so he take we, a, didn't he take a picture of one? Like he, he says he has. Okay. Um, I'm still kind of iffy of what yeah. he's dealing with. Okay. Um, so we, we formed CE4. Mm-hmm. Uh, we decided to put our focus there. We started interviewing these experiencers, we started reading and consuming all of the information we could find from the leading secular researchers in the realm to educate ourselves the best we could so that we wouldn't do more harm to these people than what the experience itself had already done. Mm -hmm. Because it was, you know, we were walking on eggshells talking to these people and we had to be very careful. We weren't licensed consultants or, um, you know, or therapists or anything like that. Mm -hmm. We were just investigators and we didn't want to get any trouble with any of that. So we read up on everything we could. We watched all the videos, from other researchers that they had produced at the time. And then off we went, we decided to start putting our own research together. And it was right about that time. It was 1996. Um, That was a busy year for me. Uh, I got involved in uh, an event during that summer uh, from a fellow in JPL Laboratories in California. They were, NASA was looking at that year, that fall in uh, November of going back to Mars, but sending a launch back to Mars. They hadn't mm-hmm. been there since 1976 okay. with the Viking, uh, Viking lander. So they decided to re-image Mars, and they were going to send up the Mars Global Surveyor, which was going to take pictures over the whole planet, Mm -hmm. and with better photography than they had back in the 70s with Viking. The only thing is, the guys at JPL that were part of this program, putting it together, one of them had a keen interest in the so-called monuments of Mars, the face on Mars. Mm -hmm. Uh, He was a follower of Richard Hoagland, and He knew, because he was there at JPL and working with them, he knew that NASA was not going to be taking new pictures of the plain of Sidonia where all of that stuff was. So he decides he wants wants to do a simultaneous public rally, protest, whatever, uh, between JPL and Kennedy Space Center to let them know that the public wants those pictures. Mm -hmm. Okay. So he found out I was MUFON director there at, at the Kennedy area. And he figured between Kennedy and JPL, we could make, get some news out of this and, you know, maybe sway their, their decision on it. Um, so I spent the next few months putting all this together on my end. He was working on his end. I ended up getting Richard Hoagland actually come to where I was at um, to speak in front of everybody. He did a, four-hour free presentation nonstop in a 500 standing room only auditorium. Um, We did the rally outside the entrance to the uh, Kennedy Space Center. The Mm -hmm. other guy did it in JPL. It was just a flat-out busy time, plus me working full-time, plus I was working on a couple of abduction cases that were very dark in nature, Mm -hmm. and I wasn't understanding them. At the same time, I had gotten myself involved in new age and metaphysical teachings. Uh, been involved with them for about three years, four years at that time. When I first got involved in ufology, 
I had no spiritual background at all. I was a agnostic humanist. Right. Um, the only thing I was concerned about was working and where my next beer was coming from and raising my son. Mm -hmm. So that changed when I was working with these abduction experiencers because they seemed to have some kind of spirituality that they had connected to uh, in a hope that it would help them. And I had to explore that because it was part of the experience. Mm -hmm. And as I explored it, it consumed me and pulled me right into it. And that was a new age in metaphysical teachings. So all of this involved in the middle of 1996. I had a girlfriend at the time that I was uh, working with in my research. Uh, she was glad to be there and help out. And it was good I had her to help out because a lot of the experiencers are women. And yeah. if you know anything about abductions, there's a lot of sexuality involved in abductions. Right. So I don't want to catch myself in a room trying to get information like that. So it was good to have her there because she could do the interviews and then, you know, feed me back with the information that she'd come across. The thing is, she was a Christian. Mm -hmm. I was into new age metaphysical stuff. She was a Christian. Two things we decided we would not talk about when we were together was politics and religion. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we got along great. Well, she saw that I was having trouble between too much work being too busy in these two cases that were very dark in nature. She pulls me aside. This is about the first week in November, right around the time of the launch in the rally. And she says, you know, I think you need help in this area and protection. And I said, what do you mean? I reached in my pocket and I pulled out all my gemstones. And I said, I got all the protection I need right here. Right. She says, no, not really. I said, she says, you need more than that. And mm -hmm. I said, what are you talking about? So she reaches over, pulls out a Bible and says, I think you need what's in here. And I went, wait a minute. We talked about not getting involved in religion and politics. Right, right. She says, no, I think you really need the help that's in here, the protection mm -hmm. that's in here. And I said, now we talked about this. And then she calls me out. She says, you know, you tell everybody you're the most open-minded objective investigator there is. And I said, yeah, I'd like to think I am. Mm -hmm. He says, oh, then you'll take a look at this, right? Well, I just been had. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I said, all right, I give you 15 minutes. Show me what you got. Right. Most amazing 15 minutes of my life. Oh, wow. She shared with me the gospel in a way that I had never, ever heard it before. Mm -hmm. Or maybe it was just the time that it was right for me to actually listen to it. I mean, I grew up in the Southern Baptist church, but yeah. I just never made a profession of faith. But this moment, I, after hearing what she had to offer in that Bible, God's word, I said, you know what? I want that. Mm -hmm. And 42 years old, 1996, November 10th, I gave my life to Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay. So here I've been, I've had the perspective looking at ufology as a, agnostic humanist mm -hmm. i've had the opportunity to look at ufology through the eyes of a new age metaphysical person and now i'm getting ready to look at the world of ufology through the eyes of the belief as a christian so i've not just come at this as a christian i've been able to see this from three different perspectives right. where most people never get past one right want your listeners to be very understanding of that because that's important to this research. Mm -hmm. As I became a believer, I felt that God says that, you know, I probably shouldn't be involved in this phenomenon. Yeah. Well, as I tried to back out of it, tell my partners, I said, you know, this is not what it seems to be. I says, uh, we shouldn't be dabbling in this. I said, I think I, you know, I'd like to back out and not do it anymore. Well, God had other plans, and he says, you know, I want you to take this back to where you came from. Mm -hmm. In other words, take what you've learned back to the realm of the New Age metaphysical or the humanist, secular, secular humanist realm. Share them the truth. And I said, God, I can't do that. These people don't believe your word to be true. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I thought that would hold him off. 
I didn't know you don't tell God what you're not going to do. Right. <laughs> I was just a new believer, right? Right, right. So a couple of weeks went by, and, you know, I, there it is again. I want you to take this back to where you came from. I'm going, God, I can't do that, you know? I said, you know, here's the, here's the thing. I understand God's word. I believe it to be real, but you need to give me something more than that. Right. Man, I'm challenging God now, right? So I thought that would hold it off. Comes back a couple of weeks later. You already have what it takes. And I'm thinking, what is that? So I talked to one of my partners, and I said, we need to go back and look at some of the stuff we have. Something's here that we're missing. So we did. We went back and looked at some of the case histories that we had. We used to videotape them with, you know, the big camera, VHS cameras then, and uh, record them. And there was one we went back and played, and we looked at, and amazingly, we did not catch this six months prior. Mm -hmm. Probably because our eyes were blinded, and we couldn't see the truth. But now that I've become a believer, I was wide open to the truth, and here it was. Mm -hmm. We had recorded it already, but missed it. This man started telling us on the video, he'd already told us six months before, but we're watching the video, and he's telling us about an experience he had one night where it was a horrific experience, mm -hmm. and while it was happening, he cries out, Jesus, 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 or Jesus, help me, mm -hmm. and immediately the experience stops, and he wakes up in the bed. Well, I got to tell you, that goes against everything every secular researcher ever said. Right. So e either this guy's lying or not understanding what happened to him. Mm -hmm. I don't know. So I got to find out if this is real, this is huge it because is. this is not talked about. This mm -hmm. is unheard of. Mm -hmm. If it's real, this is huge. This I can take back. So I needed to find out if it was real. So I contacted the leading researchers, all of them that I could get a hold of their phone numbers, called them at home, said, Hey guys, you know, I'm so-and-so, I'm researching abductions. I've come across a very unique case. I'd like to share it with you. I'd like to get your opinion on it because I don't know if it's real or, or not. You know, should I look into it or should I just move on? And they all asked, share the case with us. Mm -hmm. So I tell them the story. And then after I tell them the story, each of them told me, said the same thing. Can we go off the record? And I said, absolutely. I said, I don't mind going off the record. I just need help in this matter. And off the record, by the way, is something that um, if any of your MUFON members out there, you know what that means. Mm -hmm. That means that if somebody wants to share information with you and they ask to go off the record, you can share the information later. But it's total anonymity on where it came from. Right. You don't give the name. Right. So I'm not going to tell you who's told me what, but I'm going to tell you what they said, because that I can do. What they told me was they too had come across cases like this, where they had people that had either called out to Jesus or called out to God or said a prayer or hummed a hymn or quoted scripture and the experience stopped. Mm. And I said, wait a minute. I said, nowhere in any of the literature you guys have put out, have you said that's possible? Mm -hmm. All of you say it's not possible to stop an experience. But you're telling me now that you've got cases that you've come across that have. Why is this not being talked about? Mm -hmm. Well, the first thing they answered with, almost every one of the same answer, was we didn't know what to make of that. And I, I would have totally accepted that. If you had said, I honestly don't know what to make of it, I fully understand. Yeah. But the problem was they couldn't stop there. They had to give me another excuse. And the other excuse was we couldn't go there because it might affect our credibility in the UFO realm. Oh, wow. In other words, they couldn't get into spirituality or religion yeah. because people wouldn't respect them for it. That was like a taboo area mm -hmm. in ufology. And I said, thank you, guys. I know this is there. 
I said, I'm going after this piece of the puzzle because you guys aren't. And mm -hmm. I said, I got nothing to lose here. Um, I work for a living. I don't rely on my, this information. But I will put this information out there and make it available for peer review. And they all said, please do, because we can't. Mm -hmm. So we went after these cases. We made ourselves known on the early internet there. Um, a couple of newspaper articles we had went worldwide. And, mm -hmm. uh, it got us out there and recognized where people could come to us and share their testimony like what we had come across. Mm -hmm. And no ridicule. Um, we didn't need to have their last names. We just wanted to document the cases to show that this is possible. Mm -hmm. Well, it's been 20 some years now. Mm -hmm. I've dealt with over 600 plus cases in the past 20 years. Cases that can testify that the name and authority and a relationship with Jesus Christ stops these experiences. And not just stops them, but terminates them from repeating in your life. Mm -hmm. That is huge. So here is something that the secular researchers still don't agree right. that they can be stopped. Mm -hmm. Yet they're still asking the same question that they have been for 30, 40 years. Why does this happen to certain people? Yeah. Well, in our research, we found that answer. We found the commonality amongst these people that answers that question. And it's not just one answer. Mm -hmm. It's one answer or a possibility of a combination of three answers. Mm -hmm. The first answer, some people ask for this. And you think, why would anybody ask for this? Because people are curious. People are that curious where They'll be driving in their car, and they've been studying this, and they stick their head out the window going down the highway, yelling at the sky, please show me something. You think they don't do that? Mm. I was one of those that did that. Mm. Be careful what you ask for. Right. Okay? Because there's somebody else other than God that's listening. So that's the first one. The second one is people are involved in things that open themselves up to this experience. Right. And these things I'm talking about are things of the occult, mm -hmm. of new age and metaphysical practices. These can be anything like tarot cards, channeling, um, ghosts, even UFOs themselves. Mm -hmm. Any of this unknowingly opens you up to a realm that the Bible warns us not to be part of. Amen. That's okay? right. So you may not have opened yourself up to this specifically, but you're dabbling in areas that Scripture tells us not to, mm -hmm. opens that door. Well, that was fine for most of the people we dealt with for our cases. But there were a few cases that came to me and said, you know, I don't fit those first two. And I says, how's that? They said, I remember having experiences since I was a child, six, seven, eight years old. Mm -hmm. I couldn't have opened the door to those. I was, had no knowledge of it at all. And I thought, you know, you're right. So we had to rethink how this was happening to them. And then I got to thinking about it. And then scripture came to me about spiritual head of the household. Mm -hmm. The man is the spiritual head of the household. Amen. Yes. If the man, the father, is not keeping a spiritual covering over the family, the rest of the family is susceptible to the wiles of the enemy as he is. Yes, God. <clears throat> so I started asking the right questions. I went back to these people and I said, let's talk about your family life that you can remember as a child. What were your parents into? What were they, did they have any associations with any organizations you know of, mm -hmm. like Masonic Order or anything like that? Um, were they churchgoers? Were they followers of any specific religion? Every time we would get into their family life, we would find that's where the open door was. Mm -hmm. And it was being carried on to the children. 
And these experiences would continue until you were able to stop these experiences and understand that they can be stopped. Mm-hmm. Um, keep in mind, we're talking about ufology right now and, and alien abductions. Mm-hmm. But I will tell you, through the research over the years, I have found that all of this stuff is this, has the same source behind yeah. it. Oh, yeah. Um, demonic source. If you're studying ghosts, if you're doing channeling from spirits, if you're dealing in in tarot cards or palm reading or horoscopes, or let's get to the old-fashioned stuff, drugs, gambling, prostitution, um, sex, anything else, uh, you know, that the Bible talks about, any of that has the same powerful demonic source behind it. And the way that it can be stopped is all the same. Mm -hmm. We found a way that specifically dealing in alien abductions in ufology, the name and authority of Jesus Christ and a relationship with him stops it. Okay. Absolutely stops it. That shows who the source is behind it. Yeah. But we've also found that with any of those other sources, that same authority will stop that too. Oh yeah. Okay. So, what we have found over the years is that ufology and its idea behind it is not what it appears to be. Mm-hmm. So the question might be, well, why is it even there? Why are they even doing this thing? If, if this is demonic, why put on this deception? Mm-hmm. Well, because this deception serves a purpose. This deception, everybody that gets involved in it in one way or another, it pulls them away from the one true God. Yes. We see it over and over and over. Is that, is that why most people that have had abduction, air quote, abduction experiences always say that these entities say there's no God or you know, some of that, is it, do they rail against the Judeo Christian concept? Do they go against Islam, Hinduism, any other type of religion? Do they just attack Christianity? That's a good question. And that's one that uh, my partner, Guy Malone, that I've been working with over the years, Mm -hmm. um, that's the part that he covers. When we do conferences and we're together, uh, we call it the one, two punch. We have two pieces of evidence to show the source of this enemy. Uh, mine, I usually come on second, and that's the testimonies themselves. Mm-hmm. Testimonies of a life changed, a horrific life changed from these experiences through a relationship with Jesus Christ. The other part of this is, is Guy Malone, he comes on with his talk, and he covers the communication that's involved between these UFO abs- abduction experiences and the people that are having the experiences from the entities and the experiencer. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of documented communication. The communication is always anti-God, anti-Christ, anti-Bible, anti-creation, but never anything else. Okay. Mm -hmm. They always talk about future events of cataclysmic events that the world's getting ready to come to. Mm -hmm. We already know that's coming in scripture, but the stuff that they foretell doesn't come true. Yeah. where we know that scripture is always a hundred percent accurate mm-hmm. on prophetic events. The, the question is that that's a major red flag in the communication that you bring up because why would they come if these were true extraterrestrials from other worlds and they were coming to this earth, why would they come to preach a, a new gospel right. that, only goes against Christianity. Right. Why that one when there's so many other belief systems out there? Mm-hmm. But you know, there's really only two belief systems. Your listeners need to understand that. And that's part of how this works. There's two belief systems in the world. There are many aspects of one of the belief systems, but there's mm-hmm. only two belief systems. That that believes Jesus Christ is God come in the flesh mm-hmm. and died for our sins, and all of those other ones that don't. Yeah. So in essence, there's only two, 
and they come here to bash the one. And that is a red flag if you're looking at this in any way at all. Mm -hmm. So that's what Guy Malone and I do is bring these two pieces of evidence to the table. So what are we dealing with here? Are we dealing with physical entities? No, we're not. The researchers show that what we're dealing with here is a spiritual experience. The experiencers themselves, when they tell you about what they remember from an experience, they tell you it's so real. You mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. I know it's real. I know what happened to me. Well, really, they don't. Because what they're, they're telling you is they remember something that is a memory. They're, they're, they're telling you a memory, okay? They're remembering something that happened, but the memory is not real. Mm -hmm. And the way we kind of figured this out is, let me give you a for instance, because this is important in showing what this actually is. If I asked you about your last birthday, and I said, you know, tell me about your last birthday. You know what you did. You know where it was. And I said, I'm going to have you sit down, and we're going to relive your last birthday. Well, as a safety specialist, I learned how to in, in do investigations on accidents. So we have to get to the root cause of an accident. Mm -hmm. So if I ask you a question, you tell me, and I go, and I bring you deeper and deeper and deeper. I don't use hypnosis. I don't need to. I just need to ask the right questions. Right. So I can do the same thing with your birthday. And you can tell me the temperature, just how it felt, hot or cold. You can tell me whether you had wind blowing on you or not. You could tell me whether you were on, on hard surface or soft surface, like maybe at the park. Mm -hmm. You can tell me all of the senses that you have, you recorded in your mind. And I could get you to tell me every one of those senses and what you felt. Now, if I do that with these experiencers and go back and have them relive their experience of mm -hmm. what they remember, all of the senses aren't recorded. Only enough information is remembered to make them think that they had an experience. Mm -hmm. Just the sensational part is remembered. There are no details. I can get you to remember every detail. Policemen do this under interrogation with people. Right. Ask the right questions. They'll remember everything. Mm -hmm. Okay. But under these experiences, there is no everything. Right. So what's happening here? What we have is a vision type of spiritual experience that people are having in the sleep state sometimes in the wake state. We know scripture, people had visions in the wake state. Oh, yeah. Okay? So we know that it's possible. Nothing here I'm talking about goes against scripture. But we know people have dreams. Mm -hmm. This source behind this, this demonic source, has the ability to give us this dream, this vision in the dream state. And it's like having, it's like going to a play if you've ever been to a play, you go into this auditorium, the play is up on a stage. And let's say the play is about uh, the storyline has to do with being in a living room. Mm -hmm. So the people who put the play on try to get you to feel like you're looking at a living room. Mm -hmm. But is everything there on the stage like your living room? No, it's not. They only put enough objects for you to get the idea that you're looking at a living room, okay? These experiences are the same way. These entities only give enough information for you to realize that this must be where I am, I'm at. Right, okay? right. But you're not really there. It's only in here, okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's the proof of that is, is all the senses weren't recorded. They only gave you enough sensational memory for you to believe it to be real mm -hmm. but when you dissect it they understand i've been duped yeah. okay yeah i've really been duped and you know once they come to the lord the lord and the holy spirit will show them that anyway so what are we dealing with here we're dealing with spiritual entities that are here to deceive humanity to get them to take their eyes off the one true god 
-hmm. For what purpose? So that they are doomed. So that the enemy can say, in the end, well, God, you weren't so big. You couldn't save this one. Yeah. This, what looks like this is, is what is referred to in Scripture as the grand delusion. Yes. And it says that God would send a grand delusion. Yep. That if it were possible, even the very elect would be (laughs) deceived. And I'm telling you, this deception is so powerful, so complicated, yes. so deep that many, many super smart, super intelligent people are being deceived. I taught on that in Bible study about the deception uh, three, four weeks ago. Yep. You know, what all, you know, what it may look like, what it may entail, uh, not getting so caught up on american politics you know this is not our home the whole spiel and so i i that's that's awesome what you said i'm i'm thinking let me let me get you to answer these three things i'm thinking sure. you speaking uh the first one would be in response to this being spiritual what do you do the first part is what do you do with a person who wakes up saying they are sore from anal or vaginal penetration um the second part would be so we see or we know okay these are spiritual why do they only come at nighttime which you probably answered in part why don't is it possible that they can come to the daytime and then the last part if you can address well i saw something in the sky moving and i don't think it was an airplane had the lights it was it was defying gravity it was defying physics. What do we do with that? And what do we do with the TikTok videos? What do we do with the uh, new Navy pilot videos being released by media outlets, the U.S. government? I got answers for all of that, especially especially that third one. Oh, please, please <laughs> have at it. The first one. Not just dealing with um, feeling like you've had a rectal probing, Mm -hmm. but some people wake up and they have scars on them, marks on them, um, look like they've had uh, needle injection points on them, Mm -hmm. um, all sorts of things. They feel like they've got an implant in them. All these things are physical markings that here I told you that this is not a physical event, Mm -hmm. but yet there are physical markings being left. There's a couple ways that that's being used against the person that's that's having this experience. One, there is a small possibility. We do know that if these beings are what we believe they are, which is spiritual angelic type beings, we know from scripture that these beings have the ability to manifest into the physical. Okay. Is it mm-hmm. possible that they're manifesting physically for a short time? And if they are, they're doing what they need to do to make the event as believable as possible. Okay. You're not being taken anywhere, but they can they possibly come here to actually leave marks on you? Good possibility. Odds are that's mm-hmm. not what's happening. Most of the time, what we deal with, yet, you have to understand as a honest researcher, you don't go for the extreme answer first. You eliminate everything else that could possibly be it. And if you're left with an extreme Mm -hmm. answer, so be it. So there are a lot of things that can happen that people don't realize. People wake up with marks and they associate it with these experiences. But, you know, I'm an old guy. Um, I'm a cancer survivor from prostate cancer. I get up every hour of the night to go to the restroom. Do Mm -hmm. I bump into things? Yeah, I bump into things. Do I remember them all? No. Mm -hmm. Do I wake up sometimes? I got a bruise on my shin. Yeah. Do I remember how I got there? No. But if I thought I was an abductee, I would think, ah, they've been back. See what I'm saying here? Mm -hmm. Things Mm -hmm. can happen at night that can leave marks on you that you don't remember. They may not even happen at night. Whitley Strieber pulls this gimmick, and I I wouldn't doubt it. Stephen Greer's doing it now, too. 
And mm. Whitley Strieber, he's, he wrote Communion uh, way back when, New York Times bestseller on his experiences with um, abductions. When mm. you hear him do his talks, he has a, a neat trick where he intros at the beginning. I've been to one of his talks years ago where there were 500 people in the audience. And he starts out by saying, you know, how many of you here have ever woken up and found marks on you, you know, of all these different types and can't remember how they got there, you know, and two thirds of the audience raises their hand and he goes, you might be an abductee. He just set that suggestion into their head. Okay. Right. Suggestion is a powerful, powerful thing. Mm -hmm. But did he, all these people have that experience? No. People wake up all the time with marks. They not just wake up, they see a mark on them. They go, where'd that come from? Mm -hmm. It's not unnatural for that to happen. What's happening is the enemy, this enemy, this spiritual enemy is around us all the time. They live in a dimension that we don't see, but they see us mm -hmm. all the time. They know everything that's happened to us. They will use everything to their ability to perpetuate this delusion. You must understand that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so hopefully that answers a lot of that. Oh, yeah. um, the second one, second one was... The sightings. Yes. So along, if, along the same line, and this ties into the last one also, I can do the two together. First off, as a MUFON researcher, investigator, we know, and MUFON will state this, that 98% of the millions of reports that have come in over the past 60, 70 years are misidentified. Mm -hmm. Okay. Misidentified because the person saw something. Just because he couldn't tell what it was doesn't make an alien in nature. Mm -hmm. It just means he couldn't tell what it was. Mm -hmm. okay? That's why the terminology has changed from UFO to UAP, mm -hmm. unidentified aerial phenomenon. Mm -hmm. Okay, It's gotten more stringent on what they're talking about. I first started hearing this about four years ago when I went back to the States for a MUFON symposium and I was in a director's meeting and I was listening to people making a comment, other directors about certain um, events that had happened and they were going, well, maybe that wasn't a real UFO. And I got to thinking to myself, what the heck does that mean? Not a real UFO. Mm -hmm. If it's not a real UFO, then it's identified. You know, it's either it is or it isn't. Right. And I, it took me a little bit over that weekend to finally realize that wasn't what they were saying. Mm -hmm. what, they, what was happening was they didn't have the terminology for what they were trying to describe. Yeah. And eventually when this stuff came out about the Navy, all of a sudden now it's called UAP. And mm -hmm. then I got, ah, that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to specialize that 2% mm -hmm. that is truly different, okay? The ones that they, they absolutely know is not a misidentification mm -hmm. and is truly something they can't put a name on because it goes against everything else that should be happening. Right. And, and if you listen to Louis Elizondo do his talk uh, from his time in ATIP, you will see that some of the work that's going on with him and the organization um, to the Stars Academy with uh, Tom DeLong, mm -hmm. a lot of the stuff that they're looking at here and a lot of the areas they're looking into, if you start looking at it it's there and question it yourself, you'll start to see that the things they're looking at here are ideas that go against natural physics. Yeah. Okay. Well, Physics are physics. There's no such thing as going against physics, mm -hmm. okay, um, in, the na in the natural realm, which is where we live, in the natural realm. Right. These are God's laws. God put these physics in motion, okay? Science just recognizes them. Mm -hmm. There's speed of light. There's gravity. There's all these things that are there. 
Is there a place that they don't exist? Well, maybe. Maybe in that spiritual realm, Mm -hmm. they don't exist. So what are we seeing here in these events? If If we're believing that the abductions through the evidence are spiritual events, is it possible that the sightings are too? Is it possible that we're also dealing with a spiritual experience with the sightings? Mm-hmm. Well, I, our research seems to say yes. And the reason I say yes, and this is why the secular researchers are pointing in that direction of it being interdimensional, okay? They're even, and this is something coming from another dimension. And the reason it can behave the way it does is because it's not from our dimension. Mm. Um, how do we explain that? Well, I got to tell you, my mentor at the beginning of all of this was Dr. David Allen Lewis mm-hmm. out of Springfield, Missouri. He wrote the book back in the 90s called UFO End Time Delusion. There's a chapter in his book called Flatland. And if you've ever heard the story of Flatland, there's actually, you can go to YouTube and see Carl Sagan talk about Flatland. And what he's doing to describe what a fourth or fifth dimensional entity experiencing into the third dimension would appear like to us. Okay. So this has been talked about for some time. Mm -hmm. What we're seeing with this Tic Tac is exactly that. It's showing every sign of a manifestation. That's the term I'm going to use because that's Mm -hmm. a scriptural term. That means it's not truly here. It's manifested into our realm. Mm. Okay. You have to understand that only God creates. The enemy cannot create anything. The the enemy can't just show up with it and create a physical ship, Mm -hmm. but it can take, matter and energy and give us the illusion of a ship. Oh, wow. Okay. Now, wasn't TikTok off the coast of Virginia? Virginia no, Virginia? that was San Diego. San Diego. Okay. And that's mm. not the first time we've seen this. And there's, there's another aspect to this also that makes you wonder um, and look at this as a a, you know, a spiritual entity or interdimensional entity. Mm-hmm. Uh, another one is the story of the school in Zimbabwe where the hundred some students had an encounter on the playground. Oh, I haven't heard about that one. Oh, you need to look that one up. Um, that one is absolutely fantastic. And I got to meet one of the girls that was, uh, that was uh, one of the kids there. She's grown up now, but I got to meet her. Well, a couple of years ago at the MUFON Symposium in Philadelphia. Mm-hmm. And um, she talked there about her experience. Everything about that experience points right at a, spir- a spiritual event. Okay. Mm. Everything that is talked about there has been talked about before, the way that experience happened. And it happens in close encounters, what we're talking about. Um, another phenomenon that's part of all of this Uh, was documented and and reported back in the mid-90s by an English English researcher named Jenny Randalls. Mm -hmm. Jenny Randalls was documenting cases where when people have these type of encounters, these uh, paranormal type encounters with these ships or beings or whatever, something happens Mm -hmm. different to them. Um, and this answers why some people see them and some people don't yeah. when people are together. People report while the experience is happening that it seems like time is distorted for a short period during the sighting. They report all sound stops. It's like they're inside of a bubble. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the event is inside of this bubble. This is a time distortion event. This is the same type of event that the CERN collider is trying to create. 
Oh, I just had that conversation today. Uh huh. <laughs> so many of these experiences, recorded experiences through sightings, have recorded this phenomenon. She termed it the Oz factor. Mm. If you look that up, it gives it, you'll find a description on Google and Jenny Randall's associated with it. And I just did an interview um, yesterday for, for my show, Piercing the Cosmic Veil, where the gentleman had an encounter with the being in Australia during the daytime, mm. awake, and everything, everything pointed at that Oz factor experience. Mm. Mm -hmm. in a, he was in the bush area and where there was plenty of noise, birds rustling of the trees, wind blowing. And when this being showed up, everything stopped. Total silence. It felt like time was distorted. Mm -hmm. um, everything pointed at exactly the same thing. So that is what happens when there's a manifestation. Um, I even had the opportunity at that same symposium two years ago uh, to ask a question at the end to um, Travis Walton. You know, I've listened to Travis for many years over the, over the time that I've been in this, seen him at many conferences. But this one, after listening to Louis Elizondo, I had to ask the same question to Travis. Mm -hmm. And I never heard anybody ask this before. And at the end of the talk, I got up there to ask the question, and I said, Travis, I've got a question here. And I want to take you back to the moment that you guys were in the truck. You saw this light in the trees, and you, the truck come to a stop, and you jumped out to go check it out. Mm -hmm. At that moment, that's where I want you to go to right now. And I want you to tell me what you hear and what you see. And he paused and I asked him, I said, my question, is there any sound? And he's looking at me from the stage and he goes, it was totally silent. Mm. And it shouldn't have been. Now, people have questioned over the years, did Travis truly have an experience? Mm -hmm. Was he abducted? I don't think he was taken anywhere because it goes against everything our research shows. But did he have an experience? That tells me absolutely. Mm -hmm. Because the rest of his guys drove off and left him there. Um, what happened to him the rest of those next few days, I don't know. But I know from what he's telling me, that Oz factor happened. Mm -hmm. And that tells me that was a spiritual event from these entities. And it's forever changed him, just like I told you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So uh, I hope that kind of answers the question. Oh yeah, most definitely. Mm, trying to see which way I want to go because I want to. I know we got to wrap up on time. If you can briefly answer these two, and then I'm gonna do a segment called Rapid Fire, and just Rapid Fire is just I'm gonna give you some some names, some events, and just put that in a nutshell for me in that section. But one, why do these entities? Why, or let me say this, are they why are they attracted more so to women is there any connection to genesis 6 1 through 4 on that aspect and i know we briefly talked about this and you said it this is profound why are we not seeing this more being reported in other ethnic groups or let's just say black americans where a lot of encounters are happening with white americans um, could you touch on those briefly for me? Sure. Um, why women? Two parts on that one. Remember, I told you that this is an open door, open door experience. Mm -hmm. So women seem to be the ones dabbling more into this than men are. Okay. Um, they seem to be more susceptible because they're opening that door. And a lot of them have already opened doors into other things, not just into ufology. Because they're all connected, it ended up getting to that point. Mm -hmm. um, the second is there's a control factor that they can do with women. And that brings me into the second question. Mm -hmm. um, that control factor is 
this whole thing about the hybrids and the alien beings perpetuating a hybrid race using women, mm -hmm. impregnating them and taking the babies and all of that, that all came from Dr. David Jacobs out of Temple University under hypnotic regression. Mm -hmm. um, that whole concept doesn't even need to be real. Okay? Mm -hmm. Let me explain why. Remember, this is a delusion, mm -hmm. not a reality. This is a delusion. This delusion, all it needs to make it work is to make you believe it. Okay? So for a woman, what's the strongest aspect of a woman? A maternal instinct, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you convince a woman using her maternal instinct, you've got her hooked. Mm -hmm. It's going to be very hard to get that woman to understand that wasn't real. And I'll tell you, it is a difficulty uh, with the ones that I've worked with that once they are convinced that they've had these children and have seen these children and other uh, experiences, mm -hmm. it's very hard to pull them back to reality. So I believe it's used as a control factor. Do I believe it's actually part of Genesis 6-4, um, where it talks about um, being scum and you know, mating with the women mm -hmm. and creating an offspring? I do not. I do not believe there was any connection at all. Mm -hmm. I believe that connection happened um, back with the works in the early 90s of uh, a Christian researcher. I'm trying to remember his name. Uh, he wrote a book, The Alien Agenda. And in the book, he made the connection. He says this, this work of David Jacobs, talking about abduction experiencers, talking about hybrids, sounds a lot like this Genesis 6-4. Mm -hmm. And then he made a leap of faith, and I'm talking a major leap, and said, well, that kind of was like, you could say it was like in the days of Noah, yeah. you know, from Matthew 24. Uh -huh. Well, you would think if it was that important, wouldn't it have been talked about in Matthew 24, right. where it's not mentioned at all, mm -hmm. you know? So what we're dealing with here, and I'm going to have to, call some people out on this is this whole concept of Nephilim and giants and all of that in today. It's all sadly based off of flawed secular abduction research mm -hmm. because they're taking this whole idea from Dr. David Jacobs, which all of his stuff comes from people under hypnotic regression. Mm -hmm. Okay. I don't use any hypnotic regression and I've been able to show you that these people have been deceived. Yeah. Where he will tell you, and I've got it recorded, it's on my YouTube channel, you can go listen to, where when it's brought up that these people have been able to stop these experiences through Jesus Christ, he will tell you that all of those people are deceived. Okay? So let me tell you what happens when you get into this kind of fight. Mm -hmm. When you kind of get into this kind of fight, that means you can't take the word of any experiencer period. Okay. Right, right. So he, 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 he took it to that level, but the difference is what he has, he can show no proof. Mm -hmm. The difference, what I have is I can show you a life changed through a relationship with Jesus Christ. I have evidence cases upon cases, upon cases, upon cases that these experiences can be terminated. Mm -hmm. I have the evidence. He shows nothing, mm -hmm. but this Christian researcher Many of the Christian researchers out there have connected on to his findings with no evidence and connected it to Genesis 6-4. So this flawed research, let me tell you why his research is flawed. I've listened to his case testimonies you know, on, on, that are out there. Mm -hmm. I don't believe he's leading these people, like some people say hypnot, hypnot, hypnotists do. I don't believe he's doing that. The problem is these people have led themselves. They've, they've deceived themselves. Here's how this works. If you have a dream about anal probing mm -hmm. and a horrific experience on a steel table on a spaceship, mm -hmm. you're going to go tell your family doctor, right? Mm. 
No, you're not. Mm -hmm. He's going to think you're crazy. No, and that's the last that. guy you want to be able to think you're crazy. Right. Because you're going to lose your job and your family and everything else. Mm -hmm. So who do you seek out? You seek out an abduction researcher who will listen to you. And guess what? He puts you under hypnotic regression. You have just given your free will away to whoever's out there, like the demonic realm. Mm -hmm. And they will feed that story to no end. Remember suggestion is one of the most powerful things to affect the mind. Mm -hmm. Okay. These people have already suggested that they are experiencers before going to that abduction hypnotist. They already believe they are. They want him to, they want him to prove it. And he will gladly put you under and let you fill the story in yourself. That's not real. Okay. So that research is not acceptable in court. They, all the courts will tell you hypnotist, you know, regressions are not acceptable. Mm -hmm. They're not trustworthy. That's why I never use them. The testimonies I have are from people that actually have gone through and told you what they honestly remember. Mm -hmm. And then they will, you will see that they understand that they've been deceived. So there is no connection with Genesis 6-4. These people that are pushing this Nephilim giant and hybrids in the world today, that's a dangerous thing to be doing. And let me yeah. tell you why. Because they're talking demon seed. Yeah. They're talking demon seed heresy. Mm -hmm. And what happens when you talk demon seed is you're looking to demonize a population of people. Yeah. And in, throughout history, anytime a population is demonized, mm -hmm. There's a Holocaust. Mm. That's deadly stuff. Mm. So I say, get off this stuff. Don't follow it. And be careful what you do follow, okay? Because this is wrong teaching. Yeah. Now, the other, one, the other question of why is this not a common part of the black culture or Asian culture or any of the other cultures out there? Mm-hmm. That's a good one, and I talk about that in my book. Before I came over here to Korea, I used to listen to all the other researchers out there, and all of them will tell you this whole UFO phenomenon, abductions, UFOs, is a worldwide event. Um, okay, there's reports from different countries, but what they want you to understand is it's the same as in America or in Europe mm -hmm. or in Mexico you know, or Canada. It's not. Mm -hmm. When I came to South Korea, I didn't see anything going on here at all in the UFO realm. And that puzzled me. You guys said this was worldwide. There may have been a dozen reportings over 20 years in Korea. Mm -hmm. but I thought, what is this? So I, as I made Korean friends, and they all speak English, I said, what do you guys think of this UFO phenomenon? Uh, we know about it, but we don't have time for it. What does that mean? So, and I kept hearing that over and over. Yeah, we know about it, but we don't have time for it. Mm -hmm. so I finally got one of my really close friends. I said, can you explain what that means? Am I not understanding your language? You know, what does that mean? I don't have time for it. Well, he says, we don't. And I said, well, tell me why you don't. Mm -hmm. He says, well, if you've seen, you know, what's going on in our country, we were devastated, destroyed 65 years ago. And now we're one of the top technological countries in the world. I said, yeah, I know that. He says, but we're still divided from old and new. Mm -hmm. And he says, the old farmers out there that are still, you know, in the agricultural state, you know, that we always were. Yeah. He says, uh, he says, they don't have time for this. You know, they, they wake up, they do their farm, they go to bed, they wake up the next day, they do their farm, they go to bed. They don't pay attention to any of this stuff. They don't have time for it. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> he says the middle age that were born after the war, he says they're either running a business full time <clears throat> to make a bunch of money mm -hmm. to pay for their kids' colleges so their kids can be the best in the world, mm -hmm. or they're working for a company a lot of hours to make a pile of money 
so that their kids can go to college to be the best in the world. So we ain't got time for that. Oh, okay. And then you've got your young kids. These kids here, unlike America, go to school 10, 12, 14 hours a day. Oh, wow. No kidding. Why? Because they want to be the best of the best, mm. not the best Koreans. They want to be the best in the world. These people here are on fire to be the best in the world. And their country is showing it mm. through their technology. Everybody in America has got something, either Samsung, LG, Kia, oh, Hyundai, yeah. you know, it's all taken over. My wife what has used a to Hyundai. Be, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, and then people say, well, maybe they're just not outside very often, you know, and I'm going, no, nope, that's not true either. Mm -hmm. Any time that these people do have any time on their hands, they spend it with their family. And maybe not just immediate family, but with elders and everything else. Right. The favorite pastime of the Korean is outside hiking, outside bicycling. Mm -hmm. Okay. These people move when they're outside. Uh, they make it a, a you know a, a, a thing to climb every hill in this country, mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, not me, but they do. And so they they are outside. They do see the opportunity. So what are we talking about here? So you've got Korea that has almost zero involvement. And then you've got America and Western countries that are wide open where this whole thing has taken over everything. Yeah. And then you've got countries in the middle like Japan. I've done 20 trips to Japan for my job mm -hmm. since I've been here. I made friends in Japan. I talked to them about it. Japan is opening up to this. Even their uh, prime minister's wife, came on publicly and said that she was an, abdu an abductee. Oh, wow. So, I didn't know that. Yeah. So why hmm. Japan? Because Japan, from what I see, is about 30 years ahead of Korea from the war. Yeah. So they've developed themselves enough to where they can take the time and relax a little bit. But what hmm. happens when you have time on your hands? You start oh, looking yeah. at your computer. So put this in a nutshell. America has more time on their hands than they know what to do with. <clears throat> so they spend it on the computer looking at crazy stuff. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Japan, they get a little bit of time. Guess what? They have a little bit of experiences. Mm -hmm. Korea, they ain't got time for that. Their time is focused. Mm -hmm. Their time is you're either making me money or you're not. So they don't have it. Mm -hmm. So it comes down to, in a nutshell, that this whole experience could possibly be based on time on your hands. Mm. And I don't mind, so, it's a devil's workshop. Yeah, you said it. <laughs> <clears throat> so let's take it back to cultural. <clears throat> the Koreans already have cultural issues, and that's something I'm looking at to write in another book. Mm -hmm. Different cultures have different things that have pulled them away from the one true God. Mm-hmm. They all have their myths and legends that they're involved in. And Korea has their own. Japan has their own. They're not the same religions. The old religions aren't the same. And even in America, we have cultural differences. Mm -hmm. And in the beginning, when I got into ufology, that's one thing I noticed right off the bat. This seemed to be a predominantly white phenomenon. Yeah. And... I, I question that, you know, where's the black folks and where's the Hispanics and where's the Orientals in America that, why aren't they part of this? What, mm -hmm. Why the difference? If this is all about genetics and everything, you know, is this a white supremacy thing that these aliens are into? Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. know, um, I don't know. So I had to start questioning that. Well, who am I going to ask? I go talk to black folks. Mm -hmm. I talk to preachers. I talk to working people. Um, I talk to, you know, non-religious people. And I said, hey, what do you think about this UFO phenomenon? Well, like the Koreans, black folks in America see everything that the news and TV and movies put out on this alien stuff. And the comments that I got back, because 
I was honest enough to ask the questions was, I don't want no part of that, Mm -hmm. you know? And I had to keep asking the question, well, why not? What is it that keeps you from not wanting to be part of this or have an interest in it? And they all saw, they all commented about the oppression of the phenomenon. Mm. They were able to see how it oppresses people that get to become involved. Yeah. And with the black culture of history of oppression, they were not about to open a door to something else to oppress them. Mm -hmm. And I thought, wow, back again to opening a door. They know, okay? They don't want to be part of this because of what happens with it. Oh, yeah. They don't want any more of this stuff, okay? Now, you... You mentioned that before we came on the air that this possibly is changing with the younger generation Mm -hmm. as they're blurring all these lines, you know, and and, and becoming open to everything. And that's a possibility. And that's something I will be watching for is to see if we get more involvement culturally, you know, besides just predominantly white in this phenomenon, because keep in mind that, you know, if this is grand delusion, then you know, it's going to be going after everybody. Yeah. And I don't think the grand delusion is just one particular event. I think it's a combination of a lot of things. You know, the enemy has a, has a million doors out there. He says, hey, pick one. Which one do you like? You know, he's got something for all of us to turn our eyes away from the one true God. Amen. Where, where Jesus says he stands at the door and knocks. And knocks. You know, one door where the enemy has a million. Yes. They all lead to the same place. Damnation. Hell, you know, there you go. Yeah. That's, um, you know, even thinking about the, the opening door and the oppression piece, it, you know, it just, it's, dem- it seems you can hear the, the, I guess you would say the tone, the demonic oppression and just, I don't want to have any parts. I mean, cause you know, growing up black and you hear that, the automatic answer is, well, the demons. So that's, well, that's demonic. I want to do with that, you know? Exactly. And you would even hear stories from people would say, uh, like with sleep paralysis and, and something was in my room, but I screamed Jesus, you know, and you put the two together, like with more, you know, African-Americans or blacks or whatever. And then you see with the, uh, with white America, you put the two together. Well, you scream Jesus and both of them go away. You put the connections there as well. Like, what else could you conclude beside this is a demonic presence? This is dark in nature. This is anti-God. This is trying to put fear in you. It's trying to scare you. It's trying to turn you away. Cause most people that say they had these, you know, car- cross culturally, they wake up feeling depressed. Like something really disturbed me. Like it violated my personal space and my home, you know? And, and so I think that's the importance of, always praying. I can't iterate that enough with friends, sure. my family, my wife, pray before you go to sleep. Yep. You know, that name of Jesus, we just had in Bible study. Uh, we dealt with Philippians 2.11 about how powerful that name of Christ is. Paul said, every knee in heaven, on earth, under earth has got to bow. And so at that name, what? It flees. Yep. So, um, I tell you, what, let's do this uh, rapid fire. I want some. Uh, these can be quick, just in a nutshell, and then this is going to be it for us on tonight, on today. Um, so, rapid fire is going. This is something new to TBT Jose Four Six. I've been contemplating on this. So, Mister Joe Jordan has the pleasure of being the first guest of doing <laughs> rapid fire. All right. So, let me know when you're ready. I'm ready. All right. Cool. Ali asked the Crowley. Ah, uh, probably opened some of the biggest doors we could have ever had opened. Um, worked with JPL, mm-hmm. and I think that's a serious demonic connection with NASA uh, mm-hmm. that people have talked about. And he actually reported this guy that, or this entity that he experienced that seems to look a whole lot of like what people are seeing today in the abduction experience. JPL, tell the audience what JPL stands for. Uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Um, They they work with all the satellites and uh, some of the launches and space missions that NASA puts up out of um, California. 
And JPL is connected to my next one, Jack Parsons. Oh, yeah. He was part of JPL, and uh, he had associations with Crowley. Mm -hmm. And I know there's some, there's some great work that's been done by uh, Mike Barra. He mm -hmm. wrote uh, with uh, – he co-authored with Hoagland, The Secret History of NASA. Mm -hmm. And they lay out the whole connections between Crowley and Parsons and even the Nazis, um, the whole thing going into the early history of NASA. Okay. Um, the Babylon working. Uh, don't know much about that. I know of it. Just don't know much about it. Okay. Roswell, the crash on Roswell, New Mexico. Was um, it a balloon that burst? I believe it was. Okay. And I believe that the enemy has, has used this as their foundation of the modern myth. Um, mm. I've been, out, I've been there many times. I've been out into the desert. Um, I follow the works of David Flynn and his numbers that he was able to find a location. And we went to that location. I truly believe that the enemy has used this as a spiritual event to perpetuate this delusion. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, grays. The grays are what is commonly reported seen. Um, during abduction experiences and even during awake experiences, mm -hmm. um, people reported them. The one I interviewed just yesterday on my show talked about seeing a gray in the daytime. Um, I believe that these entities can appear as anything. Keep in mind, they're going to appear at what it takes to deceive you, yeah. what it takes to get you to believe in, that they're real. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, to believe the lie because we get appearances of all different types. Even the idea of a gray, they appear as different forms of the gray. Mm -hmm. it, it's all about what it takes to convince you. That's how a delusion works. Mm -hmm. Men in black. Um, that's an interesting phenomenon. Is it? Myth? Uh, I've, I've read a lot about it. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's become a myth. I think there, it's based off of some things that actually did happen. I believe in the early days of ufology, I believe that there were probably um, government people, agency people that would follow up on reports. And uh, I think the people were just, um, I don't know, um, a little shocked at what happened and memories become distorted and it turns into another American myth. Project Blue Beam. Blue Beam. Project Blue Beam. Man, I've been hearing about that one for 25 years. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and I keep coming across people that bring it up like it's brand new. They, they just heard about it. Uh -huh. But now it ain't brand new. It's something that's been talked about. It's talked about the government pulling off a fake invasion of aliens by using holographic images in space. Um, do we have that capability? I think we do. Um, I think it could be used in wartime. I think it might have been used in wartime, um, you know, as trial error. Um, but, you know, that's another fancy thing out there to get people's attention. Um, if you're a true believer in Jesus Christ, you won't be deceived. Amen. Collins Elite. Collins Elite. Fascinating story from Ray Boche, covered in the book, The Final Events by uh, Nick Redfern. Mm -hmm. uh, which I myself have been there also. Yes. Um, great story. I, I have no doubt that it's uh, a real story. I trust Ray Boche. I, I talked to him on Facebook. Um, I don't, you know, I, have, I don't believe that is, there's any distortion there at all. Mm -hmm. And because of the story that comes out of there, you know, the question comes up, does government really know what's going on? I do believe that there are aspects of the government that does know that this is demonic in origin. I believe that the guys at ATIP found that out. I believe that Tom DeLong has the suspicion or knows this. I think that this is why disclosure is not being done because, you know, the, the Brook, NASA Brookings report from the sixties talked about what would the effect be on humanity if, you know, if the disclosure was to come about that we met an extraterrestrial, uh, you know, whatever. And they talked about how, you know, possibly the religious side of the humanity would be 
upset. Uh, I think the fear that the government has realized, because I think they know what this is, I think it's backwards. Yeah. I think that the non-believing, non-spiritual people, non-religious people, the secular people, I think they're going to be really upended when they find out what this truly is. When they find out that God is real, the devil's real, and they've been duped. Mm. Well, I tell you what, this has been an awesome episode. Uh, another fascinating one. This is probably my one of my favorites, if not my favorite. I think this, we could have gone for a little bit longer. Um, but I don't want to talk tie up your time or uh, Mr. Jordan's time anymore. Um, Mr. Jordan, if they want to get in contact with you, where can they do that at? You can reach me at my email, CE, the number four, president at yahoo.com. I have a Facebook page, CE4 Research. I got a YouTube channel, CE4 Research. Um, what else? Website, ce4research.com. And, you know, feel free to contact me by email. If you have a, you know, if you're a testimony and you'd like to help share it with us to help reach somebody else, and help them get free because that's what that's what we do. We post the testimonies so that others know that there is a hope. Okay, yes. um, we just started a new website. Also, it's uh, www.piercingthecosmicveil.com. Uh, it's based off of our just published book that's now on Amazon, Piercing the Cosmic Veil. And everything you heard tonight, I cover in that book. That book is probably the best evidence you could have in your hand to share with somebody else that needs to know the truth. Um, please purchase the book. You don't have to try and remember everything yourself. You can just say, look right here. This guy has the evidence. Here it is. And like I said, I got over 60 testimonies in there, you know, to, to convince you or to show you that this ain't what you think it is. Yeah. And um, for anybody that may have had an experience where you think you have been abducted, but you have listened to us, this podcast, you listen to Mr. Jordan talk, and you realize this is nothing coming from Pluto or Mars, that these are dark spirits, entities, demonic, and you want them to leave your life. I'm going to ask Mr. Joe Jordan to lead in prayer before we close out. Do you want to lead us in prayer? Um, sure. If anybody wants to accept Christ in their heart. Sure. You can do so at this time. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this great opportunity that Trevor's made available for the listeners to hear the truth about what this deception is. For those that have been involved in this deception in any way that are starting to look at it or have spent time into it, extensively, there is a way that they can be free from this experience. And that's through a personal relationship with you, Father. Heavenly Father, we'd like to give them the opportunity today to be able to make that connection with you, to make that relationship with your son, Jesus Christ. And Heavenly Father, we'd like to do that at this moment now. Listeners out there, if you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, we'd like you to Take that opportunity to, to do that right here, right now. If you can say in your heart, in your mind, in your soul, that Jesus Christ came to, came to this earth as God in the flesh, he died on the cross for you, born of a virgin, died on the cross for our sins. We are all sinners. We come from a sinful nature, from the fall of Adam. He came to pay for those sins for us so that we could be back in a connection with God himself. God wants his family back. He wants you back as part of his family. And that way can be done right now through acceptance of Jesus Christ, acceptance of who he is, who he was, and who he is to be. And if you can make that commitment right now, say it out loud, say, profess it with your mouth, you too will be a believer. You too will have eternal life that he's offered with us. You too will have that personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You too will have the protection from all of these experiences that could possibly affect you in your life. You will have the most powerful weapon in the entire universe that was given through us 
through the Holy Spirit. And that's authority over everything above the earth, below the earth, and on the earth. Don't let this deception deceive you. Right now, you have the opportunity to be free of any of those deceptions the enemy throws at you and to be able to help others to also be free. Make that choice now. Make that choice to follow Jesus and follow his teachings and be free and free indeed. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Mr. Jordan. God bless you and your ministry. I would love to do this again. Um, I really enjoyed you on the night. So, and I can't wait to read your new book, Piercing Through the Cosmic Veil. You guys heard where to contact him. Please get that book. I know it's going to be awesome. I, I, there's days where I sit and listen to his lectures on YouTube. Trust me, go listen to those lectures on YouTube. You, it, you will do yourself a favor, especially seeing the testimonies actually get on the stage with him. That's phenomenal. So, but you have been locked right in here to another Truth Be Told, Hosea 4-6 podcast. This is your host, your co-host, Trevor Delaney, Trevi Trev. Thank you all so much. And we'll catch you on the next one. We love you. God bless you. Peace.